Coming up today on episode 10 of the Elevate 02 podcast, Santa Farkey is here, and I'm handing out a lump of coal to Money Mitch. He doesn't even know why I'm mad at him, but he's going to find out in just a matter of moments. Then we all talk about the Arizona Coyotes situation. Are they the worst run franchise in all of professional sports? The guys share their unique perspectives on the Coyotes. And then former NHL defenseman Kevin Miller stops by, spent seven years with the Bruins. He talks about what it was like to watch Marshawn Bergeron and Pasternak on a nightly basis, why he ended up going to UVM for college, and so much more on how he developed his unique play style. Enjoy episode 10 of the Elevate 02 podcast. This is the Brady Farkas. This is the Elevate 02 podcast, brought to you by Money Mitch, the podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey. From on the ice to inside the front office, we bring you places you've never been before. Now, here are your hosts, Tori Mitchell, Jonathan Bates, Brian Strait, and Brady Farkas. Welcome in, everybody. Episode 10, Elevate 02 podcast, our, our Christmas uh, Eve's Eve's episode here. Very, very excited about this. We've got a great guest. Kevin Miller is coming on, former Bruins defenseman, played at UVM. So Mitch and Batesy know him. So we're pumped to have Millsy coming on. And, uh, well, let's just get to it. I'm Farky. Money Mitch is here. Strader is here. And hold on a second. I know that guy in the fourth box of our Tough. of our video Tough. here. Who is is that, that Jonathan Bates gracing that handsome, us with that his handsome presence? Devil right here, Farky, just blowing me up, buddy. Just, okay, you ditched out on the Geo interview. What was the big work emergency in episode oh, nine? God, you know it's. Uh, I know you guys don't like to hear this, Strader for sure. Sorry, buddy. Plug your ears. Q four, <laughs> okay. Q four. All right. Q four. Mitch is looking at me like, what the hell is Q four? What like he's like the Audi, like the Audi Q four. What is so that? Is it over yet? This Q four. <laughs> It for me, it it's pretty much over. I'm now I'm forecasting okay, for Q1. Okay, so so just so long as you guys don't want to hear more about this, I'll stop <laughs> talking about it. Okay, but, <laughs> but I will say this that I, I that I missed the geo interview for good reason. Okay, so we should all be happy about that. And you guys did a hell of a job, by the way. That was great, great work filling in for me. Well, That's no easy feat. <laughs> well, thank you. Geo was awesome. That was a great one in episode nine. Uh, I went in to elevate. O2, the facility uh, earlier this morning, actually. Mitch looks awesome in there. We were last in there. Hard to believe. That was three months ago that we taped episode one and two when we were in there together. It looks freaking great. I can't wait to be back in it together. We got to get a live show going again here, you know? But uh, yeah, the new office looks good. We're, uh, it was nice that you, that you popped in there. That was, uh, I didn't expect that. I like that unannounced. Does yeah, it still, it was, Farky, Farky, quick question. Does it still look like an, a, uh, an Apple store? Everything's white? Does it still look like an there, Apple there's store? A, there's a legitimate doghouse in there. It says the sure. Elevate 02 doghouse, D-A-W-G. I'm like, is, does Mitch's, what do you have, like a little French bulldog or something? Does your dog hang out in there? Is that, what is that for? He's here sometimes. Pete has three dogs. Swaggy P has three dogs. So he brings the uh, dogs, they roam around. They got a little place to hang out and, uh, I bring my, they, yeah, it's two English bulldogs and two French bulldogs. So they're Instagram famous right now. We can straighter, talk to straighter, about straighter. It's, it's an Apple store. Come on. It's an Apple it, store. That's what it looks like to me. I mean, I, it's, I, I so, can't, it's very trendy, very contemporary sleek. in there. Ooh. Sleek. You can I guess walk that's barefoot. a word. Barefoot. <laughs> you can walk barefoot in there. <laughs> Pretty much. Can I tell, go ahead. before we get into this, can I tell a quick story? Sure. I tried to give Mitch a Christmas gift and he rejected it. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> wow. What me? Don't what I've been sitting on this for like eight days now and you're going to hear about this. Hit me with it. So it's like, I don't know, probably, yeah, about eight days ago. I ask Mitchell, I go, hey, Mitch, what size sweatshirt do you wear? Large or extra large? He responds in 0.2 seconds. 0.2 seconds. He goes, I wear a large. I go, I got a Brady Farkas show hoodie for y'all. Happy holidays. <laughs> No response. Ghosted. No, like, hey, looking forward to it. No, thanks. No, drop it off. No, here's where I am. No, mail it to my house. No acknowledgement of it later. We've taped, like, we talked, we've exchanged 150 fucking text messages about this thing in the last eight days about Why this podcast. It off today? Because I gave it to part-time Danny, who works at the radio station, because <laughs> he didn't want it. PT Danny got the sweatshirt? 
Yes, part time Danny at the radio station. My guy, he got the he got the Brady Farkas show sweatshirt. I had one left. I was like, you know what, Mitch has been pretty good to me in twenty twenty, give twenty twenty one rather, give me this opportunity. I'll give it to Mitch. He didn't want it, so straight, there you go. Mitch, I, just, straight, yeah, I what about good us? Where were we yeah. on the list? Straighter, right? you wear a large. I'm a medium, but Straighter wears a large. But Straighter yeah, is definitely an XL guy. Batesy is definitely a medium. Oh, so Mitch was the only wow. one that could fit in the large. Oh, you think so, I look like an XL guy? Oh man. How tall are you? Oh, okay. Well, tall. Yeah, I know. These run a little I bit. Were, I thought you were taking a run of my weight at this point. You know, I know oh, I retired no, no, no. recently. No, these run oh, a little bit. They run a little bit smaller. And I tried to give it to Mitch. I had one left, and Mitch, no Mitch. acknowledgement. Uh, I don't know if I big timed you or I got sidetracked. I probably, I'd like to say I big timed you, but <laughs> unfortunately, I don't really have much of a recollection of the conversation. So, okay, well, let's see yeah, here. I got the phone. I got the phone. Let's pull it up. Hold on. Before we get into the actual, you know, CSI investigation here, can I just – I don't like to defend Mitchell. We all know that. But in his defense, he is the most forgetful human being on the face of this earth. So that, that, that is that, what, that, dude, I've showed up at your house. I've showed, up, I've showed up at your house. Time out. I've showed up at your house before, no, it's, and your wife is like, out. oh, I didn't know you were coming. I'm in a fucking business where I'm – you have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Strader, what's going on with you, man? Where in the world? Hold on, Where... I want to finish this okay, real quick. I want to finish this real quick. December December ninth, eight forty two p.m. Do you wear a large or an XL sweatshirt? Eight forty two p.m. The response comes large. Eight forty three, I respond to him. Hey, I got a Brady Farkas show sweatshirt with your name on it. Happy holidays. No response. You were at the phone. You were looking at the phone. You were active on the phone, and you have spent. You have sent me. Uh, I will say. Let's see, this was 13 days ago. I have at least 15 text messages from you individually since what, that time. And the then next, plus all the generic podcast ones we have is the four of us. You can't defend message? yourself. What was the next next message I sent you? The next one was like four days later about the podcast. You know so what? Clearly, can I, can when I you, play when referee? You text me the next time. Maybe, maybe, real quick, it. maybe I don't want... What? I, I'm just going to say this. Even though we already gave away the sweatshirt to part-time Danny. Okay. PTD's got it, but maybe, maybe somebody in our audience can email the account and they want it. We could do some sort of trivia shows, question, whatever. And, and they win the, 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 the sweatshirt when you want new ones. Maybe just, maybe I want them to keep it for the Brady Farkas show. Okay. This is the oh. elevator two podcast. Suck it for Well, <laughs> I thought it was a nice gesture. I thought it was a nice gesture and it got, uh, it, it got, uh, I don't know. I got fucking ghosted. Farky, just stick to like Starbucks gift cards. It's just- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, I had to get that off my chest. It feels a lot better. So. Fair enough. All right. I want to hear How what's we- going on in Strader's world real quick. What's going on there, Brian? You doing? Not you much. doing good, buddy? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm in New York right now, going to a game tonight. So. This normal this is life. Your, this is your like. We're a couple of days away from Christmas. Like, have you got yeah. all your shopping done? Are you good to go? I like, did. I okay, did. great. The beauty Good. of online shopping, Batesy. Uh, Same. You Same. can what do you do need it from online? anywhere, and you can get it sent right to your house, and it's really about the timing of making sure you can get to it before your wife gets to it and opens it up, and you're like, oh, there's your Christmas gift. I wouldn't <laughs> even do online shopping if I were you. I'd go to the devil's offices, look in the back rooms, and see what old bobblehead giveaways are back there, and snow hats, and my well, brother for, used to work for, for ESPN. Kids, Sparky, I don't think that's what my wife really wants no, for Christmas, <laughs> Everybody yeah. else. I mean, okay. my brother used to work at ESPN and used to work on all these podcasts. And for like three years, all I got were old podcast giveaways. I got a Woj pod hat. I got a Jonathan, a die fantasy football focus bobblehead. I got all kinds of weird things just from the basements of ESPN. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> actually awesome. I actually believe that I um, one year when I was with Pitt, I got they're doing the Sidney Crosby bobblehead giveaway when I was up there. So I took a bunch of those and gave those out for uh, Christmas gifts one year. And I'm actually, I'm pretty sure those things went up in value too. So I might have to get them back. <laughs> <laughs> They're still in the box. That'd be perfect. That'd be All perfect. right. Let's, All right. let's get into episode 10 now that I've vented enough. The big story around the league for the last week plus has been coronavirus and the team's on pause and games being canceled. 
there's a lot of stuff going on with that. You can find that anywhere. Our goal at, at Elevate 02 is to kind of branch off to things you won't find everywhere. So as we get towards the Olympics and the situation becomes more tenuous there, we probably will address the COVID stuff. But there was something specific that I wanted to get to here at the start before we got to Kevin Miller. Are the Arizona Coyotes the worst run team in sports? I mean, my God, they make the Detroit Lions look fucking stable. Like, the Coyotes were in bankruptcy a decade ago. They've only made the playoffs five times in 20 years, and everybody in the NHL makes the playoffs. They're going to get locked out of their arena. This is a disaster. Yeah, I mean, you you know, Bates, I'm sure we're all going to say the same stuff here, but they're, you know, when you see all the articles coming out about how financially all the financial troubles you you tag that on with how bad they are right now that's when it's like it gets glorified to what what is happening maybe the nhl has to i mean if i feel like every year they they revisit the fact that if there should be a team there or not but when they have but you know they, they get a little momentum if they make the playoffs but right now it's it's like depressing to watch them play i mean they pretty much lose every single game i'm hoping montreal can uh, lose a few more games but it's like they're not catching they're not going to catch the uh, the coyotes in the, the loss column this season i mean they are awful it, it's tough and I, I you know i think the most frustrating thing for i don't even want to say coyote fans because not, I'm not trying to kick them when they're down, but I don't think there are too many Coyote fans out there. But just for hockey fans in general, is there's just so much instability surrounding that organization, and it's not just for you know one, two, three years. It's it's been consistent, really. I mean, really since probably two thousand. Yeah, well, no, not two thousand because when they, they made the down, playoffs a bunch when they came from Winnipeg, but, like five years in a row, and they've been well, awful since. Really, no timeout. Really, really, when you know, let's give them a little bit of credit when they moved from downtown Phoenix to Gila River Arena, which is in Glendale. That's really when there was a big shift because there was some popularity around that that team, you know, in the in the JR days and and Keith Kachuk and and you know Shane Dur- Shane Doan's kind of you know elevation to real core performer in in the league but you know then they move from downtown phoenix all the way out to gila and you know people are going to go to to glendale eight times a year on a sunday to watch a football game people aren't going to go 40 plus times a year on a tuesday thursday whatever to to glendale to watch a hockey game And, and and that's challenging you know um and then surround that by the instability with with ownership right I mean, Jerry Moy sells the team to Gretzky and, and his group, and he's still part owner. And then the league takes it over because they're in bankruptcy and they own it for three, four, five years, however long it was. And then, you know, they think that they found the the, the, the stable environment that they need, you know, the, these guys with deep pockets. And now you, you start reading all this stuff over the last 12 months. You know, they can't pay their bills. They're not reimbursing employees. <laughs> their leases run out. They've got nowhere to play next year. It, it, it's tough. It's tough, not just for, for Coyote fans. It's tough for the game of hockey. I, I think that we would all agree with that. What do you think, Strader? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I look, I don't want to come down on them too hard here. I just yeah. think they're going through a transition period again. Um, they're in a clear rebuild. I think Army has shown that. Um, he's trying sure. to collect some picks here and and kind of build this thing from the ground up. And he's moving. He moved, you know, good players out the door like uh, Dvorak this offseason. So, there's a what I like what they're doing and what he's doing is there's like a clear path right to what yep. he's trying to accomplish here, which is what they need. They need a stability stability of like this is the game plan, right? Yep. And what better time to do it when you're going through this crazy time of like making the transition to we don't know where we're playing uh, in the upcoming mm-hmm. years yet. So it's kind of the right time to do it for them, to be honest with you. New regime. Don't know where you're going to be playing. Not a lot of stability with the Glendale thing and stuff. So I think, I think the guys who are making decisions there are doing a pretty good job for what they they have right now. Is it yeah. possible they don't even have a team next year? Is that out of the question? No, no, no. no I don't think that's, yeah, I yeah, think that's that, not possible. That's not possible. Yeah. yeah. The it's just, where, where they're going to play? I'm, I don't. I don't. The question like is that. where they're going to play. You yeah. know, I think that that's the biggest issue right now because you know everything with Glendale is what it is. You can read the articles. Um, you know, do they move back downtown temporarily? Um, you know, when this this building gets you know put together in, in Tempe, is that their you know permanent home? Do they partner with Arizona State? There are just too many what if scenarios right now. But to Strader's point, 
the, the they are army's doing the right thing like army army is a smart hockey man he's you know he's drafted well in his time in st louis he knows what it takes um you know he's essentially buying picks right with with taking on bad bad contracts and and holding those um close to his vest so that he can get you know first second third round picks to to rebuild through the draft and you know people when you rebuild through the draft the most difficult component of that is patience you know you have to be patient you have to continue on that path if you don't continue down that path if you think that you're better than than you actually are too too much too soon whatever it is th- then you're in trouble and and he's he strikes me as a patient guy we've had a number of conversations over the years and you know to straighter's point he is doing what he needs what needs to be done Mitch, you talked a couple episodes ago about playing in Buffalo when you were losing. Call it what you want. No one will call it tanking overtly, but they are not putting the best team on the ice right now so that they can go and build for the future like that. Would you ever sign in a place like that? And what would be your attitude if you were on a roster that was doing that? Well, I'll tell you a crazy story. I don't know if I told it on one of the episodes, but our captain, Brian Gianta, met with Tim Murray, our GM, and Tim said, which of these two goalies, I'm not going to name names, are is better? And he said, I like this. I think we think this guy's better. And they were two guys that had already been, that we'd already picked up through trades, and he traded the better one the next day. So Geo, you know, we were tanking. It was very clear that we were tanking. We wanted McDavid. Um, I know Edmonton obviously won that lottery, but and and Buffalo ended up getting Eichel. Here we are, but uh, that that actually happened. Wow, <laughs> that yeah. actually wow. happened, right? And though uh, Strader and Batesy uh, being on the other side, obviously, no, those conversations go on. But it was like when you when you involved a player, the captain of the team, and he shared it with a couple guys on the team. Just like wow, uh, literally, he asked me who the better goalie was. And he just got traded today. And I told him this info two days ago. Uh, it was cra- It was mind blowing. It was just like, wow, we are trying to, we're, we're already in last. And now we're really trying to finish last. Um, unfortunately, they finished last. And, and I mean, I got traded at the deadline. They finished last and didn't get McDavid. But, um, you know, they gave it a good crack at it. Um, it's it's depressing being as a player being on a losing team like that. It, we talked about it already. It just weighs on you every day. I mean, you show up and it's like, well, we lost seven in a row. What's what's eight? You know, what's nine? You, know? you just you, you reach a point where you just have like your inner like you're you're competitive. All the guys are competitive, so you just you know you're unfortunately I don't like saying this, but you're playing for yourself. You know, you're like, all right, like I'm a competitive guy. I got, I'm here for a reason. I got here. I made it to the NHL. Like I, at least like, you know, I have some pride here. Um, but you see, I mean, we must've had fucking, how many guys on the roster that year, Batesy? Fucking 90, 70, oh, who knows? Like, a lot, a lot. Record number yeah. of guys just yeah. coming through, coming through. It was yeah. just like, it was insane. Like there was two new faces in the locker room every week. And you're like, <laughs> and not, not for injuries. It was just like, you know, just revolving door of guys just in and out. I mean, I think we went through like seven or eight goalies that year, Farky. It was just wow. insane. It was insane. <laughs> the tank was on for a generational talent. They didn't get him, but um, being part of it. I mean, as far as the, the, the second part of your question, like, do you want to sign there? I mean, in the off season, you know, you, Everyone has a fresh start. So when you show up to training camp and you sign with the team that finished in last place the year before, you're not thinking we're, we're tanking. You know, you're excited. You, you sign a new deal. Yeah, you want to be there. You know, maybe they offered you a little bit more money than the other teams, but because they're a last place team the year before. But you're showing up with a fresh attitude and a, fr- a fresh start. Um, so, yeah, you, you still want you still sign with teams like that. But as far as a, from a player's perspective, but it's like the losses and like fit finally finding out like, yep, yeah, we, we actually are tanking right now. And being part of it is, it just weighs on you every day. Straighter, I got a question for you. And this is rare, especially in a sport like hockey or basketball. It's, you'd see it more in baseball where, you know, a 20 year old kid comes up and then signs a 10 year deal and he's locked in and he's the, the foundational piece. But I am kind of curious if you were a guy like in Mitch's situation, you know, you're at the end of a deal. Of course, you want to win. You don't care at all about what the organization does in the future. You're only worrying about now. If you were a young player who was on a long-term deal, would you ever be okay with the tank? Because, like, 
hey, I'm going to be here and see this thing at the end. I can forfeit the next two or three years if it's going to pay off in a big way down the line. Yeah, I, I don't I don't believe so. Um, to be quite honest with you, if you have a player that's OK with that, you probably give the money to the wrong guy. Um, hmm. I, I don't obviously there's going to be an explanation there to a young player that you have locked up, but like Tori just said, like everybody is pretty damn competitive in the NHL and really like you need to build a team around competitors. If you don't have those guys and, you know, I kind of always highlight the, um, the practice fight with uh, St. Louis when they, when they end up going on their cup run, I know you guys remember that, right? Was, yeah. uh, Sanford and Bortuzzo. Bortuzzo, Bortuzzo and Sanford and, you know, for a lot of the outside people and fans, that looks like, wow, look at this bottom-dwelling dysfunctional team, right? Well, really what that is is uh, a team that probably has the right guys in the locker room that care, and they're out there battling and competing in last place. They know they're better than this. Um, they're trying to make each other better, and that's I still remember that stuff happening with uh, my Islanders group. We were a better team than we were showing. Uh, we were in last place. They made us battle every day in practice, and we had a lot of those. In the following year, we're back in the playoffs. You know what I mean? So when you have the right guys in the locker room, there's a lot of competitive guys, and you're going to get a lot of that stuff. And for a young player, if you get guys who are okay with the tank and don't want to make that push every day in practice, then I'm not sure you get the right guy. Is it being okay with, though, or is it just a guy who's smart enough to see the long game? I'm more – you know – I I don't know. I Look, see Strader's Sparky, point. Sparky, there is no long game. All you have is tomorrow as a player. Really. If you have a seven-year deal, there's the long game, isn't there? Not really. No way. Not really. No it's way. the way pro sports is. It's all about – it's a meritocracy. It's all about what you do for me today. And, and and just to jump in there real quick, if you have that attitude, you are 100% the wrong guy. Yes, exactly. They made a mistake on you. If you have the attitude that it's a long game, you're up Shit's Creek without a paddle. You do not deserve to be there, at least not on my team. Do you agree with that, Mitch? I do. I mean, you you uh, just again, a different perspective, different side. But yeah, my first two years, you know, going to the conference finals, basically back to back years, it was like you, we better take advantage of this because we don't know when we're going to be back. And I always thought, well, we went to the conference finals. I mean, we're top four or five team in the NHL. We'll we'll be back here next year. No, we got bounced in the first round. Didn't make the playoffs bounced in the first round, then I was on another team, you know? So it just, it happens so fast where, you know, you think you have a championship team, the window just boom, closes on you. So. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we experienced like Mitch and I have had this conversation a thousand times because, you know, obviously he c comes in as a young player and, and achieves a lot of success from a team perspective. And I came in as a, a young scout and achieve a lot of success from a team perspective. And, I mean, Mitch, like, how many times did we bullshit in the summer? Like, man, this fucking game, this is great. This is, you know, it's awesome. Like, we talked about it all the time, you know? Yeah, like, you are in two great winning organizations yeah. um, where it was, you know, the regular season was just kind of like, you know, get to the regular, get through the regular season. Doesn't re even really matter where you finish in the standings, make the playoffs because we're going on a cup run. But, yeah. you know, that, that just, that window just closes like that. It's, it's crazy. So, and, and yeah, just, guys, just with, to mentality where we need to win right now yeah. right now. and just a quick story like um uh 2011 you know we go to the cup finals and and the series before um you, we we beat san jose in five games and the series before or the, the eastern conference series went um went seven it was it was tampa and boston and i was living in boston but you know obviously there was there was a question as to whether or not you know, we were going to play Tampa or Boston. And um, I remember talking with, uh, with Stan Smeal, who uh, was my direct report. And he's like, Hey, like if the schedule comes out, these are the game. If we play Tampa here, this, here's a schedule. If we play Boston, here's a schedule, make sure you book your flights. And I was like, well, I don't know if I'll go to Tampa, you know, if, the, if, if we play Tampa and he goes, there was like a long pause. I was talking on the phone, I'm like Stan, you there? He goes, I'm going to tell you something, kid. He goes, I've been in this game since 1978. He goes, and I've been to the Stanley Cup Finals twice. This will be my third time. Once as a player, once as a coach, and now once as an executive. He goes, these opportunities do not come around every day. He goes, you get your ass on a flight wherever we're playing, huh. and you and you enjoy it. And I was mm -hmm. like, I, I, like, I had got goosebumps. I even get goosebumps just thinking about it now because literally – he was right, man. Like he was right. I was a, a naive 25, 26 year old kid thinking that this was going to happen every year. 
Yeah. Mm, for sure. Oh. I want to move that discussion into a, a slightly different one um, or slightly different direction. You talked about Mitch, like, Hey, will there be a team in Arizona? Well, the franchise will exist. The question is where will they play? And Batesy has laid out a couple of options in the state of Arizona. There's also always the topic of relocating the coyotes. And we've heard Houston as an example. We've heard Quebec city as an example, which always comes up when you talk about relocation or expansion. I can't see a team in Houston. I don't want to see a team in Houston. We've had, obviously, success in non-traditional hockey markets. Tampa's been great. The Panthers have been received well enough at times, and Nashville's been awesome. It failed in Atlanta. So we've seen it work, but I don't want to see a team in Houston. You're I think team in Houston. Right? Yeah, exactly. There was a team in Houston, the World yeah. Hockey Association. Yeah, my uh, fandom starts at the NHL. Yeah, well, gonna- uh, uh, hold on. So, Farky, real quick, just like all – like. All seriousness, there was a time when the WHA really rivaled the NHL, and a yes. lot of people were were really shaking in their boots, thinking that the WHA was going to overtake the NHL. Correct. So, so could it could it work? Of course. I think the biggest thing though is, you know, they'd have to sell the team, and and yeah. you know, in order to sell the team, you got to have an owner that wants to buy it. And from what I understand, and and Strader might know a little bit more about this, but it sounds to me like the 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 owner of the building in Houston only wants them as a tenant. He does not want them as, you know, he doesn't want, he doesn't want to be cutting the checks. So, I, yeah. I think, uh, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see him in Kansas city, but um, that's just me. I feel like that's a great sports town, mm-hmm. football, baseball. That would be, uh, I don't know. I just feel like it would be, you know, like that instant wow factor, like Vegas and Seattle. So I feel like Kansas city would be my next, uh, I don't know. That's my vote. No. Milwaukee was great. mine. Milwaukee. Well, they got an American League team. I don't. I don't know okay. if that. I don't know. Do they have? Yeah, they got a building there. They could do it. There. The Bradley I, Center. I, yeah. yeah, that's right. And I, I think it just really. We've talked about this already on the podcast. I think. I think it really just depends on if you have the right infrastructure, right? Like if you have an arena in a good area downtown where fans can get to it. The places that haven't worked out like um, so well, like Arizona and. Florida has a hard time getting their fans to get out there, obviously, uh, the sunrise as well. Like, if it's in the right setting, there's no better time than now, I feel like, the, to move a, a team into one of these markets, like with the NHL and the popularity and the way that you know, social media is trying to kind of really elevate it to um, not on the same playing field as some of these other sports, but a lot closer than it used to be back when Atlanta was in the league and, you know, it just didn't have the same – uh, glamour to it sure. as it does now. Well, let's wrap this uh, before we get to Kevin Miller. As a fan, this is a naive perspective, and I know that, which is why I'm bringing it here. I always say Quebec City because I just associate hockey with Canada. So I just think, hey, more Canadian teams would be good. They used to have a team. I feel bad for cities that lost their team. So I always advocate for Quebec City. But I have heard enough people throw enough shade at the Quebec City situation to wonder do pl- would players want to play there? It might be good for the league. It might be great for Canadian fans to get their team back. But would players actually want to play that far north? Mitch would come out of retirement to play play in Quebec City. You know, he's, I mean, he's <laughs> a French guy. Go home. He'd love it. You you would love oh, it. Please. Uh, I mean, look, they, they, the fans would just go bananas up there. I just It come, comes down to money at the end of the day. I just don't know if they have that support, uh, the corporate money. But. You know, Quebec City, they got the new rink. I mean, I don't, it would be a great spot. I just don't, uh, I don't see it happening. That's just my, uh, just from hearing the stories. And, you know, they, they built the new rink for the Ramparts. That was kind of like the, uh, for the junior team, Farky. And that was kind of the momentum that they were going to use to get the NHL team back. And it's just kind of fizzled away a little bit, you know. And uh, you look at, I don't know. I'm just, for some reason, I like lean towards Kansas City. I have no clue why. I just think it's kind of, a, I just think it's a great sports market. Quebec, I mean, obviously you're going to get the following with the fans right away, but are, they, are you going to have the money? So what about the language barrier from a player's standpoint? Was it LeClaire? Somebody got drafted Lindros. Lindros. Yeah, Lindros didn't want to be there and the, the language barrier was a big thing for him. And I have heard that from others as well. And would the Canadians even allow it? Would they want them coming in on their turf? Yeah, the Canadians like um, having Quebec City fans, you know. So that's as far as Quebec City goes, uh, they're still supporting Montreal. So 
the Habs like that. So I don't I don't know how much they would like having Quebec City back uh, as a team, to be honest with you. Mm. Language barrier, Batesy, issue to you? No, not at all. The way I mean, Rosetta Stone, come on, just hop, jump on that. You're fine. I think it's funny that the like for us, I mean, probably me and Batesy, like I don't I never saw it as an issue, right? Yeah. But I know that um, the French speaking people that live in the province, obviously, you know, they, they, I don't know, there's, there's a lot that goes on, you know, like we're going through with Montreal right now, like they need French speaking people uh, in management so that they can do the press conferences and stuff. And that's really important to them. And it should be because it's part of their culture, obviously. Um, but, you know, outside of the looking glass, me, like, I don't think it's an issue. All right, let's get to our guest, Kevin Miller, former Bruins defenseman, seven years in the league, just announced his retirement. Let's get to Kevin Miller. The Elevate 02 podcast is brought to you in part by Frank Crum. Frank Crum is a professional employer organization that partners with businesses to assist with human resources, workers' compensation insurance, risk management, employee benefits, and payroll administration. When you partner with Frank Crum, you are increasing your profits, productivity, saving a ton of time, and reducing your liability and cost. They are unique to the PEO industry because they own their own workers' compensation carrier, Frank Winston Crum Insurance, and they work with difficult industries like construction, roofing, plumbing, electricians, and even some trucking. Visit frankcrum.com and tell them Elevate02 sent you. And if you're an insurance agent or broker, visit frankcrum.com to hear how you can offer Frank Crumb's PEO services to your clients. All right, I want to welcome on our guest now, Kevin Miller, former Boston Bruins defenseman, another UVM guy. So Strader and I, I guess, are way outnumbered by the Catamounts, but I'm in Catamount country, so all is well for me. He spent seven years with the Bruins before retiring this offseason. Kevin, welcome to the show. And I got to say, you and Mitch never played together at UVM. How much did you have to? How much did you have to clean up of Mitch's mess by the time you got there? No, it was a train wreck. But thanks for having me on. Anyway. No, you heard the stories. Uh, got to enjoy a few of them. Got to connect with them. So I'm just I'm happy to be on. And and thanks for having me on, guys. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover here over the next 20 to 30 minutes or so. Um, on a serious note, to start. We know the injuries for you were extensive at the end of your career. How do you feel now physically? Uh, I've still got still got some work to do. Um, my doctors after after the season had ended just kind of said, "Listen, you need to take a break and kind of let your body heal in a, in a number of ways." And so I took about four and a half months off of like really doing much, and then so I've been back rehabbing here for about four and a half months now, and uh, got to go back and see a few of the docs in Vail, um, possibly have another surgery or not, but we're, we'll see. But other than that, the body feels good. I haven't been hit in a while, which is nice. And uh, <laughs> just kind of hanging with family. So things are good. It hasn't fully set in yet, retired hockey life. But when it does, I'll ask you the question again, maybe when we do this in person, but how is retired life right now? I think um, it's kind of, I mean, so we're, we're building a home out here. And so like, honestly, I'm more busy now than I was when I was playing. Like, I do, I joke around, like, you um, don't have the excuse anymore. Millsy. I, I got to go to practice. I got to go to practice. Like, yeah. Exactly. So like, you know, it, it's a, you go to practice at seven, you're back home at one, your feet are on the couch by one 30 and you got a nice full belly and like, things are good. So like, that's not the case anymore. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't think it really has sit in, set in, but, um, it did, it did kind of have that, that retired life feel when uh, the NHL started back up and, and like training yeah. camp came around for fall. And like, that was a little bit strange. And I think now I'm past that and, uh, and just kind of just enjoying time with the family and, and, and building the home. Are you, you watching a lot of games still? You watching the Bruins play a lot? I just haven't had time much. I catch yeah. when I can, uh, mm -hmm. usually weekends when, if they're, the boys are playing, like I'll try to watch a little bit, but I, during the week, I just, I just don't have the time. I feel yeah. like when you say you're building a home, you're actually building the home <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're the one, that, you're the one throwing lumber against. Yeah. Uh, well, what's going process. on there? Yeah. I'm not, um, I'm a laborer. I'm a day laborer. I'm not a skill guy. Okay. Clearly. 
Uh, still more than all of us combined. But you still <laughs> get your hand in the pot there. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still, uh, yeah, we've been moving a lot of gravel and a lot of dirt, banging some nails, and, and it's been snowing. I just spent a couple hours shoveling my basement out so the framers can come in. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. I love, I got to tell this story, Milzy. So when, um, between your, your junior and senior year, I was working for Vancouver. You come to development camp in Vancouver, and, and this tells you everything you need to know about Kevin Miller. I, I get assigned to go to the airport and greet all these prospects as they're coming in and, you know, get them on the shuttle back to back to the <laughs> rink. And, you know, all these kids are coming in. I'm meeting them at baggage claim. They're throwing their bags over over onto a push cart. They've got all these suitcases, everything. Every single one of them. I'm there for like two, three hours. Millsy's one of the last guys to show up. His flight lands. <laughs> I, I text him, whatever. He's like, oh, I'm coming around out of security, whatever it is. And um, all of a sudden, here's here's Kevin Miller, hockey bag strapped over his shoulder, <laughs> six sticks strap, strapped over the same shoulder, carrying a wheelie bag, not wheeling it, carrying it through security. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, like Millsy, like you got you got a lot of stuff. Like you want a cart or something like that? And he just looks at me like I just I just kicked his dog. Like do I want a cart? Like <laughs> Millsy, I would I would have had I would have had the ushers and the chaperones <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Over, over here, one carrying the other. Yeah. Oh yeah. Where's the bad guy? The bad guy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Traffic. Talk about Milzy. Milzy, talk about talk about development. Like you go to, you have such a unique story, right? You you're you're born and raised in Los Angeles. You go to prep school at Berkshire in, in New England, and and then you make your way to UVM and and you know grind it out in the American League. Like just talk about your development path because it's so unique and something that I think a lot of people find very interesting. It's funny because I, I literally before I got on with you guys, I, I literally talked to Coach Woodcraft Todd and I was he was I was connecting with him and, and we kind of went through this and he kind of was scratching his head like he had no idea I was from California and like where kind of the whole thing came from. But a um, uh, different unique uh, path that I went on. And um, I think uh, I mean, it was just yeah. It was unique for sure. A kid come from California, end up on the East Coast. I think that was kind of like my only option uh, to continue with hockey to to move back east, or and um, and then from there um, went to prep school and um, got a good education there. My parents were pretty high on that and spent some time. Uh, I, I loved my time there at Berkshire, and then from there went to UVM, and that was probably I mean the, the biggest and, and best career decision I had. And I how many offers? Just I was. There. I was looking between Northeastern Union and Colorado College. Okay. Um, very serious between Northeastern and UVM. I just – Hockey East was just such a draw for me. I mean, it was in Western Mass. Like, I would – you know, Nesson had the BCBU games on and a few Catamount games or Lowell games, whatever. And so, like, that's what we watched. And uh, that was what was familiar to me. And then went up to Gutterson and watched uh, – Mitch and the guys take on BC Friday, Saturday night, beat them Friday, Saturday, and I signed Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, you were at this. You were at oh, that. Oh, hockey's wow. player, hockey's player of the week. Thanks, oh, Mother. Oh, yeah. So oh, I watched man. those both live, and like Sunday morning, I just called Snuddy. I'm like, where do I sign, man? Let's do this. Oh. So <laughs> people cool. don't forget, yeah. Mitch. What, wow. a hell, what a hell of a weekend to pick to, for your visit because that, that was my most memorable weekend of hockey in my four years. That weekend was, was so much fun. Nuts. I mean, you guys, yeah. know, the place was, I mean, it was like, yeah. I was born, I'd never been in, like, just, yeah. like, just that, yeah. was unbelievable, and it was just, there was no question, like, that was where I was going, so. That's uh, such a, that is such a cool story. I don't want to get too far removed from this real quick, so I'm blending two, two thoughts here. Bates, he was talking about what a great guy Kevin is, and then you were talking about Nesson a second ago. So I'm friends with Tom Karen, the uh, yep. studio host at Nesson, does Red Sox and Bruins coverage there. And I asked him for some dirt on you. I said, hey, we're about to talk to Kevin Miller. Is there any Kevin Miller dirt that I can bring to the podcast? And he said, no, he's literally the perfect human. If you were creating a player in a video game, you would end up with Kevin Miller as the guy you were uh, you know, coming out as the optimal created player. He All he would tell me is that you had Navy SEALs impressed by you. That's all he would tell me. I paid him to say that. <laughs> uh, I talked to him about an hour ago. So, no, he, he, I was, it was cool to connect with him. Like, I sat down with him and did, like, I uh, went to the Red Sox game. Obviously, he's a big Red Sox guy, and I got to, got to meet him. And, uh, but, uh, I don't know, man. I I'm not I'm not all he made up to be for sure. I I'm just a regular dude, and I I was it was cool to connect with him, and I I enjoyed my time when I was when I was there. I wanted to hear about the Navy SEALs. 
I grew up, um, a good friend of mine, um, I grew up with basically since I was five years old, um, went to the Naval Academy, played football there, and ended up, ended up uh, going and becoming a SEAL. And, and that's uh, kind of sparked my interest from there. I had a couple of friends that, in the Army as well. And, and then um, he, he went on and, and, uh, and brought me in and like kind of introduced me to some of the guys in the community um, in the Naval Special Warfare community. And then it just kind of um, evolved from there. Uh, some a lot of friends and 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 got involved with a lot of people uh, in that community and I just hold those guys in such a high regard. They're just uh, I think you know as as athletes, guys, we grow up and you hang you know pictures of you know whoever Gretzky, whatever on your wall and like as a kid and 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 then for me now as like an athlete and, and retired now or even when I was just playing, like the motivation that I got from those guys to see what they've gone through. I was able to train with them a couple times and they just put me through the ringer and just embarrass me. And it's like, it's just, it's just like, so like for me, those are guys that I look up to um, and how they carry themselves and what they do. And so that's where that, that kind of came from. Nice. When, when you look back uh, and obviously uh, straighter and, and myself, we, we, we've already shared a ton of st injury stories. Um, and I know there, I don't even know if there was a season that you played all 82 games. Was there? Nope. No, so there you go. And 71. 71, which is which is, you know, the way you were you played was is still pretty uh impressive, but you know, Navy SEALs, Army, you talk to those guys about it. <laughs> those are real injuries. You know, our injuries are, you know, we get to get patched up and then, you know, we miss a couple hockey games and then we're back at it again. So that they definitely put uh put it in perspective for sure. Um but just on the injury front, uh it is it's just wild looking back at what you had to play through, wasn't it? Oh man, like it's it's oh. not like I don't I honestly don't like to even I don't know. I, we can go you through can bring it. Like it up. I, it's it's like it's like it's it's just yeah, we were just it was such a whirlwind at the time and at the you know, like um we had a two year my two year old she was two at the time, my daughter. We had my little guy on the way, like um so my my wife's pregnant and I'm like crutching around and it was just one after another and so it was just like a like a like a two year of like man we were just in it and and you talk about perspective I think that's the biggest thing that I I took away from it like hey at, at least like uh, you know like I have a healthy family and like I'm right. healthy and all these things but like looking back it was um, it was a lot and it weighed on me it weighed on my family it weighed on my kids my wife like the whole deal so I mean everyone kind of goes through that and and everyone handles it differently but. Um, yeah, it's not something that I look back on with like too much fond memory of. <laughs> I hear you. I think that's the one thing that you're gonna look back and you're gonna be like, I don't miss this. I don't no. I don't miss being on crutches and injured yeah, constantly I, and eating pucks and the next day you can't walk for two weeks. But yeah, your your um you know story is so interesting to me. I have so many questions. You know, like when I was playing, I still remember me and my uh, my buddy Tom Hickey, we used to Take a, take a look at the lineup, right? Every game, they'd have the lineup, the other team's sheet out there. Mm. And, like, there would always be once in a while we'd be up there looking and be like, that's a D-man's D-man. That's what we used to call him. And we used to call Millsy one of those. Like, like that's a D-man's D-man. You know, a guy who competed hard, played the right way, who, who was an absolute prick to play against, right? Blocked every shot. And I always find that fascinating. I never even knew for the longest time you're from California, right? And I was like, how you know you you think of California guys who play in the NHL and they all got sick hands and you know they're flashy players, but here comes Kevin Miller, who is a D man's D man. How first of all, I I, I guess I got two questions. <laughs> Number one, uh, at what uh, how how did you end up kind of forming that identity for yourself? Where, where along the road did that happen? Was it um, you know prep school or college or whatnot? And second of all, how, I guess, how did, has hockey and development for the youth levels really changed um, since you were growing up? Appreciate the kind of words, first and foremost. Yeah. Straight but, uh, seems a little starstruck. I am. I was a big fan. Uh, I, mean, I love it. Sliding out of his seat there, straight <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, for, first question is, is uh, I think I was, uh, so I got an older brother and a younger brother. Um, I'm the middle guy and my, my older brother was like too old to pick on my younger brother and my younger brother would just kind of team up with my older brother. 
So like it was, you know, kind of them versus me growing up. And I was always like, we just, I mean, it was, it was fun. We had a great time. I don't know you guys have siblings, but like we had a great time growing up and it was always, I'd always try and compete with my older brother. And it would, you know, I think my, my identity as a hockey player was kind of, kind of from day one, I was never going to be a goal scorer. I kind of knew that since I was very young, just, ne- just, I never had the, that club in my back, put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, and I always played D and basically from day one. And um, I think that having my older brother and younger brother and like trying to play with the older kids helped me a ton. And then I think it, when it really, I think I've, talk, I've talked about this before, but I think it, when it really kind of kicked in, like what I was going to be, move, if, you know, if I was going to play pro or the NHL, wherever it was going to be, was at UVM where, you know, Snetty kind of sat me down and he's like, listen, you know, there, there's a lot of guys um, that, that make a good living and, and a good career um, being a stay at home D man or like D man's D man, whatever you want, you know, and, and that that's, and so that's, you know, I, I kind of had that conversation with myself saying, Hey, if, if this is something that, that you want to do, that you need to make sure that you do the, these things well, um, in order to continue your, your playing career. Um, and then your second question was, oh, how's sorry. development yeah, changed? No. Yeah, oh, how's, how's, how's it changed out west, especially since you came up? I mean, it has to have changed drastically at this point. I mean, hundred percent. But you, I mean, you, you're right. A lot of the guys, uh, even a couple of my buddies who played in the NHL growing up from California, like spent all summer on rollerblades, stick handling, you know, and 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 they were you know skill guys and finesse guys and good skaters and the whole thing. And um, I think that's just kind of a product of how you spend your your off season development, you know, developing. And, you know, it's not like that's not in Canada, right? Cause you see guys still coming out from there or East coast, or whatever, but I think it's just more that way, just given that where the game was, was in California at the time I grew up, a lot of the guys were, were coming out, were, you know, super skilled and finesse guys. Um, it's changed. I think um, you still have that aspect out West where the guys who are coming out of there, um, it's, and it's it's like a weird stigma, right? Where it's like, you know, you get guys from Arizona or Nevada or California, this whole thing. It's like the sunshine player coming out of the West Coast. But I think, you you know, it's it's changed a little bit. The development's changed. I think you guys have probably seen it uh, just with what you guys are doing, that that it's – you get different players everywhere now. Um, yeah. The game is literally everywhere now. And I, I'm in Park, I mean, Park City, Utah, and like – and they're, I mean, they're building the rink, like literally I can see it from my window. And like, I just had no idea how much the game has actually gone just out outside of your norm of where you think would hockey would be. And, and so it's, it's everywhere now. And I think you're getting guys uh, of all different backgrounds and uh, potential uh, to, to join the game. It's funny. Cause uh, on the flip side of that, uh, growing up in Montreal myself, it was always the flashy French guys coming out of there, but there was a period there where Donald Brashear and George Larac were from Montreal, right? Yeah. So we had the two heavyweights in the NHL from, you know, kind of more of a flashy, like Mike Ribeiro type of player that would come out of Montreal, you know, Alexander Dag- Daigle. Uh, Strader, you had a good story about potentially trying to get Millsy to oh, sign one more year. Yeah. You got to share this. No, yeah, no, it was great. I mean, your last year, last year was your last year, obviously. Yeah. And I don't know exactly when you announced your retirement there, but um, you know, I remember we were going through our mid-season uh, because I'm scouting for the Devils now. I'm, we're going through our mid-season lists of you know who was potentially who could help us, right? And we're kind of in that direction of we need a guy a strong tough aggressive defender you know who's going to block shots do all this good stuff and and i was sitting there in the um midterm meetings kind of talking you off i'm like you know what is he going to play every game probably not because he plays too hard right but (laughs) but he's exactly what our team needs and then we get to the uh the end of the season i'm ready to go into the you know, our next meetings, like kind of really pound the table for you. And I just find out you're tired. I'm like, ah, <laughs> lost that one off the list. <laughs> I love it. M- Millsy, I want to ask you about, um, you know, you come up, play with one organization, you know, in their farm team. And then obviously the big club, uh, I want to talk about culture and, and what kind of the, the Bruins culture, um, you know, did for your development and your ability to transition from the NCAA to the American league, to the NHL. Um, because to me, obviously spending 
seven years in in Boston and seeing the Bruins and um, and the Providence Bruins regularly. Um, I just felt like when I watched those two teams and that organization specifically, they did things a little bit differently in just how players carried themselves, body language, um, energy, all those kind of components. So I'm just sort of wondering if there's anything specific to the Bruins um, that uh, and their culture that really stood out to you as a player. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I think the, so I came out of college in 2011. They just won the cup and, and I, you know, I came out and I, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. You know, right. So, <laughs> uh, you know, all right. So like they just won the cup and I'm out, I'm on a, like an ATO. I played a couple games in Providence and, and like, I got accustomed to that like culture that you talk about like very quickly. Um, and I think, I think I took, I think I take, and I did, I took a lot of advantage of her. Um, so I took for granted a lot of the culture that was already established there, like not knowing much else. And like, this is, like I said, it's the only team I played for. And so like, it's all I really knew. Uh, but, but hearing from other guys that have come to play for the Bruins um, that have been from different, different teams and been around and then they get here and they, you know, there's a little bit of like a culture shock, if you will. Um, um, I take for granted the leaders that I had um, in that room from day one. Um, coming off a team that just won the cup. You have so many guys in that room. I mean, I could literally go down the list um, of, of that, basically the entire team. Just being in, in training camp the next year after just winning, like the training camp was like unbelievable. The guys were going so – I mean, you guys were you – just, you just won, but like it, you're hungry. The next one, it was like you're back at it. And and that culture was was from, you know, Z, Bergie, Marshy, like Thornton, like all these guys, Boychuk, Seidenberg. Quater, all these guys that were there, um, Krejci, like I mean, like literally could go down the list, and they they established that culture, I think, and then they kept everyone uh, accountable to that, and it just trickled down through the organization, right through Providence, right through the coaching staff, right through the training, the trainers, the, the whole thing, and they've made they've been very very good at maintaining that. Um, you know, it's like it's like you put your foot down on things where you don't you don't give in on a lot and think we're either going to win or we're going to we're going to die trying to do it this way because we're not going to change it um, to, to satisfy somebody else that that may not fit into that culture. The coaching change, Claude Julian to Bruce Cassidy that happened a couple of years ago. Did anything change as a result of that or was that a player driven culture and Cassidy came in and everything was normal? I think Claude definitely drove that culture. For sure, uh, he was a big driving factor in that. And and uh, so uh, Butchie, Bruce Cassidy, I call him Butchie. Butchie is like uh, he was a part of that organization under Claude as well, right? So he was a head coach in Providence, uh, assistant coach first when I came out of my ATO. He was assistant coach to, to Murray. And then he took on the head coaching staff, and, and and he was a part of that culture as well. I think him and Claude saw eye to eye on that. Um, I think you know the majority of it, in my opinion, was driven by the players like the guys we had in that room, the leaders in that room. Um, and then the coaches and the leaders came together on what, what we were trying to get done. And then it's player driven, but, uh, but sorry, but, but, but also, um, co you know, coach as well. So Butchie was under Claude, um, saw what made him successful in that. And then carried that on and still carries that on. Um, you know, he's just, he's obviously he's a little bit different coach, but um, culture wise was a lot of the same. Makes sense. What were the what was it like to play with Marchand, Bergeron, Pasternak to see that line in action every single night, especially as Pasta started to really matriculate into the player he is today? And they are they are I mean you guys they're special players. They really they're insane. They, they they're each so it's good. really it's they're honestly so it's not fair. Yeah, I we I mean we practice against them every day and like. We may, I made. I tried to make it a point, like, hey, go against those guys as much as you can, because if you can stop those guys, you can stop anybody in the league. Yeah, and that's, that's just what what I tried to do. I think a lot of guys try to do it. It's always trying to get against Bergie Marsh Pasta, and if you can, if you can play against those guys, you're you're in a good spot. But I mean, they, it's it's not even when they really want to play and they turn it on, like you, they just you can't stop them. And it's, it's ridiculous. And they each bring their own different thing, right? They just yeah. they each bring their own thing and they bring it. So, you know, it's funny. Cause like, you think that they're like, so on tune and like love each other and this whole thing. And, 
and man, they do. They love each other. But I, I'm, I've been sitting next to them on the bench or on the on the in practice, and whatnot, and they are just going at each other's throats if someone's not on their way. <laughs> yeah. just so, amazing. It's amazing. We yeah. we had uh, Scott Gomez on one of the episodes, and he's got you know similar stuff, similar like language uh, that you're using with you know the team basically the culture the team policing themselves back when he was playing uh when the devils were yeah. run, running it in the 90s you know with legendary names like scott stevens obviously uh but you know just those guys the culture they had it's just i don't know and now listening to you talk it's identical you know there's yeah. a, there's there's a reason those teams were dynasties there's a reason those teams had such success i mean you have guys when you have your top players like that just for our listeners that are challenging each other during practice on the bench during games in the locker room in between periods the rest of the guys are like holy fuck this yeah. is the real mm -hmm. deal yeah like you, you, see, you see you see Mar i mean you see Bergy going at pasta for like hey man you like screaming at him you need to do this and the guy sitting next to him is going and this is i mean in practice Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. like, they're in practice and there's like maybe there's we're doing like a they're doing a power play and there's five on oh right they're just working the puck around there's no d-man there no nothing and like they're missing pass or this and that they're losing each other like losing it on each other yeah holding each other to that high standards I, I so it's 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 impossible for the other guys to to go out there and not give it their best and that Every, everybody jumps on board after exactly. seeing that i mean come on yeah, no. yeah, we talked. We talked about that. I think one of the previous episodes. And uh, for listeners that aren't around, you know, pro hockey uh, that often, culture is this big word that they probably don't know anything about it. And it's something you really just got to feel in the locker room. I felt it that way when I was in Pittsburgh system. And what, just like you talked about, Millsy, with you know the the top guys with Crosby just driving it from the top down. It's like wow, like you see this guy perform in practice. The way he does and how he competes and you you just fall in line you're like i gotta do the same exact thing and it went from training camp when you were there and then right down to wilkesbury and we had success there as well um but it, it is you're right it's something that every organization tries to build and once you do it's pretty seamless and you can bring you guys did it too with providence you can bring guys up from providence and they just fit right into the lineup and yep. away you go yeah and that's it's exactly how it worked guys like knew what their what they was expected of them, like yeah. uh, in Providence, they knew what was expected of them when they brought up, and like it wasn't like we need to hold your hand. It was like you're a pro. It's time to jump right in and be a part of it. And that's, I mean, that's what I was talking about. I think I took for granted that because just not knowing from other organizations. But now you look around. I'm not gonna name any names, but you look around. You have these superstars, or whatever, and you're like, and you're just wondering, what, you know, why isn't this clicking? Mm -hmm. And everybody can't be, in my opinion, Patrice Bergeron. You just can't, right? And and maybe you have the skill of that, but you don't have the, the other part where like you're gonna lose it on your best buddy line mate. Um, and so and those little things, they like you said, they trickle down. And if 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 an opportunity's missed where like he could, you know, get onto his line mate, that opportunity becomes two opportunities, it becomes three, and next thing you know, like and so I think organizations kind of look look for that and and, and want that, but the reality is, is like everybody can't be that. It's just the reality. Yeah, and you see that. You see that across other sports too, right? Like I remember watching a a football game, and 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 Peyton Manning throws it. This was three or four years ago, five years ago, whenever it was. Peyton Manning throws a touchdown, but he's barking at one of his slot receivers and and you know his backside running back who's supposed to protect him and missed a block. They still scored, but he's like just demanding perfection yeah. every single day, and, and you see that translate onto the ice with players in, in, in the Boston system. At least I did. Um, it's almost like the Patriot way filling out to the Bruin way. It's really just kind of like the Boston way, I guess you could say. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, <laughs> we, I think, so when Claude was um, the coach there, um, he was pretty tight with Belichick. There was like some synergy there. They would sit down and go over some stuff. And I mean, I think he, they both bounced some stuff off each other. Um, and I think it was cool to have that connection where, you know, you can see how successful Patriots were. I think, you know, every team in Boston wanted to emulate that. I think we, maybe as Bruins, we were a little bit closer with the Patriots um, and, and we're fortunate to have that kind of connection. But it was kind of – it was cool to have something to strive for because in that yeah. city, it's like – I mean, it's like win or die, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Well – 
I will wrap up my thoughts on this unless someone else wants to jump in. I think the word we're all searching for that, that sticks out to me is stability. And I think that's a huge part of organizations that are good. We can talk about this culture, but that culture is a product, I think, of stability. Similar, you know, ownership group, VP, Don Sweeney. You talk about Claude and, and Cassidy's relationship and then the veteran leaders that were in Boston for such a long time. The good organizations have stability and the bad organizations are constantly chasing it and they're constantly turning things over. Yeah, I, I would I would 100 percent agree. And that's because they're trying to get to that point. But it. I mean, it starts from the you know, it starts from the top. It's it's tough to have, you know, you could have the players and not the coach. You can have the coach and not the players. You're the GM, and it's, it's, so it's 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 hard to get that thing together. And people wonder and scratch their head and and, and why this isn't working. But it, it's just just small little things that change throw the whole system off. Can throw the whole system off, I guess. Yeah. Love it, Kevin Miller, former Bruins defenseman, former Catamount great, seven years with the Bees, and cleaned up Mitchell's mess after he got to Burlington. So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was there to advise him on, on the mess that, that Mitch left. I so, mean, uh, Mil said, Mil he Mil not that way. <laughs> yeah. He was sharpening. He was still, he was sharpening my skates and he was still sharpening your skates. Some, no, somebody no, no, had to no, do no, it. No, Batesy was, he knew, by the time I was there, he was like, I mean, he was, oh, yeah. he was big time by the time he, you got there. He was there. big time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got the call up, right? Milsey. I was he, upstairs, he was, man. He, I mean, he was like, too, and tie. It wasn't like, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. just paint, just like painted on so tight those suits too. I bet. Uh, Top God. floor office, Batesy, or what? Yeah, oh I, yeah, I, he was just literally right next to Snetty. Oh, yep, <laughs> yep. Although, although it was also the kind of waiting room outside of Snetty's office, like they. Oh, could we leave that part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so funny though. Like real quick, like one day, like. It, like he would sit with like recruits and, and parents and stuff. There was a nice couch and I had a desk in there. And all of a sudden, like one day he comes, Snetty comes in. He's like, uh, so Betty, uh, what time's your class today? I was like, oh, I don't have class today. He's like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, okay. I'm just going to need you to leave for about an hour because we've got a couple of, <laughs> couple of recruits coming in and I got to talk to him here. I was like, fair enough. I'll, yes, I'll be sir. downstairs. <laughs> and we don't want you here. Cause you'll just screw everything up. So. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, man, this was an honor and a pleasure. We'll look forward to doing it in person sometime and getting you up to the Elevate 02 facility, uh, you know, just outside of Burlington in person, bring you back to Vermont. And uh, we'd love to do it again in person. So, Kevin Miller, we will uh, see you on the other side. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll definitely be up there. and I'll see you guys. The Elevate 02 podcast is brought to you in part by Parkview Air Medical. Parkview Air Medical provides professional medical escorts consisting of fully certified ACLS trained paramedics, registered nurses, and physicians. These escorts accompany your patient, your family member, your friends on major commercial airlines. These transports can also be done via train and cruise ships for those who can't fly. They will assist you in making sure that the journey is safe and stress free. Free. They'll coordinate the transportation needs to and from the airport, along with wheelchair, seat-to-seat -seat transfers, and baggage assistance. They will ensure a smooth bedside-to-bedside -bedside transition. You can learn more about Parkview Air Medical online at parkviewairmedical.com. They've got a huge medical staff pool. They're able to meet those last-minute requests, and they can have an escort with you or your patient or family member in just a matter of hours. And they have access to visa procurement services also. It's Parkview Air Medical, online at parkviewairmedical.com. All right, great talk with Kevin Miller. That was a lot of fun. And uh, Mitch, thanks for setting that up. I had tried to get Millsy on my radio show before, but uh, we needed you to be a heavy hitter, so good stuff there. Straighter. A little bit of like a uh, a puppy dog when the owner comes home from a long day at work. That was you talking to Miller, I think. You were a little starstruck, as Batesy said. I, I I I always appreciated the way he played the game. I really yeah. did, and and he was one of you know he was kind of in the mold that I was as well. And I always looked up to those guys and um, compared myself to those types of players as well. So, you know, us d, d men's d men, we stick together, buddy. You know, I love it. You know, you got to give yourself a little bit of credit too, there, Strader. Okay, because you know, I don't know how many people know this, but I'm I'm quite certain you were hockey's defenseman of the year one year. No big deal. Yeah, I believe <laughs> yeah. so. I believe so. I mean, Sophomore year was a good year for me. It was. Yeah, it was. Give yourself a little bit of credit because you know you, you were no slouch back there at BU. I mean, aside well, BU well, national championship. I can't remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got a report, but. 
<laughs> oh yeah, when we get to that, we one. just Ooh. went through the scouting. Report. Oh god, yeah. love it. Oh man, yeah. Well, we have a future guest that we've already taped that has an old scouting report of Strader from uh, when he was like 18 years old. This is gold. You want to stick around to the podcast just for the next oh. couple episodes just to hear that. I'm not afraid to ask the dumb questions and look stupid every once in a while. I do it enough anyways in regular life. So, Batesy, you talked about Millsy on an ATO. Mm-hmm. What does that stand for? Oh, it's a great question. Excuse me. Amateur tryout. Okay. Amateur tryout. So um, you see a lot of ATOs uh, at the end of seasons, right, at the end of college seasons. And, and typically what they are is um, uh, American League teams signing – guys to amateur tryouts amateur players that are are going to turn pro but haven't yet signed uh any sort of professional contract so technically they are still an amateur but signing their first deal as a tryout um and and it's a day-to-day contract um you know some last one day some last one week um and you can re-sign that kind of thing so so with milsey he signed an ato with the providence bruins and, and essentially was just hey you know, let's let's throw him against the wall and see if he sticks. Um, and that's that's essentially what it is. There are also PTOs, professional tryouts for guys who are not under contract. Um, you know, maybe somebody gets hurt. You want to see where somebody's at. You want to sign him for a day, two, three, one, two, three games, whatever it is. Um, you know, uh, you can do that as well. How hard is it to make it from starting there? How rare is that? Oh, like I cannot uh, straight or we like. It's very it, it, slim. Yeah. It's very yeah. slim. Like, um, we can't we can't under un, like downplay that at all. Go ahead, yeah, Stratter, no, sorry. I mean, especially yeah, when you come in on a whether it's a PTO or an ATO. More ATO because PTO typically those are guys um maybe you bring in uh to training camp that have had or good players in the past, right? They they had NHL contracts, NHL one ways, they were playing, you know, a role for an NHL team and really you're kind of kicking the tires to see if they still have it, right? And and you let them have that opportunity to come to camp and, and win a job. And if they win a job, you give them another uh, real a real one way contract. But uh ATOs is is tough because typically if you're a good player in college and a player that everyone's after in college, you're getting an NHL entry level contract. So working your way up from ATO to, you know, an NHL career is is very impressive and does not happen often. It, it, for all the kid all the young listeners out there, if you want somebody to look up to and and you know, faced adversity and was told no night after night, I'm sure, it, like look no further than Kevin Miller because what he was able to to achieve in his in his career is very very impressive. Yeah. Especially coming from California too, right? Yeah, kind of kind of puts it in perspective where you can basically live anywhere and then work your way up and have a great NHL career and win a Stanley Cup. You know, he was was uh, obviously undrafted, didn't have uh, a whole slew of colleges lined up with full rides. Ends up at UVM, plays four years, signs, works his way through the minors, and you know becomes a mainstay. What do you what do you call him again, uh, Strader? Defensive uh... D man's D man. Right? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna even like like we didn't even get into it with him, but he didn't even make the varsity hockey team at prep school his first year. Really? Yeah, we didn't even we didn't even talk to that talk about that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like, like never give up. I know that's so cliche, but geez, uh, like, no, you right. want something bad enough, never give up. Just have Mitch, confidence in yourself, right? Yeah. Like just, yeah. Just how, many, how, how often do we talk about confidence? Put the blinders on. Don't listen to all the critics and, and have confidence in yourself. That's what he showed throughout his career, I'm pretty sure. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not – even like – look at – you know, we talked about um, Tanev too. Like, like his, you know, his story is incredible as well. But, like, at least he was found – at, co- at the college level, given the opportunity, and he's, you know, walks in the door and, and, and plays for you guys in Vancouver – this is, you know, kind of one in a million what uh, yeah. what Miller has done. Yeah, I wish well, I, I wish I, was, I knew the odds of Kevin Miller making the NHL. Like, you know, when he was a freshman in college, would have would have called Vegas on that one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff and a great career. Before we uh, say goodbye and let everybody get to their Christmas holiday, I did have to ask Mitch one question because I had this vision the other day. I'm scrolling through Twitter, and I see EA Sports put out on Twitter. They're pre- popping up. Are prepping uh, or propping up rather NHL 22, the video game. And they're talking about how you can play as world juniors and Olympians and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, I can absolutely picture 
Mitch circa 2014 playing a video game as himself. You were that guy. I can absolutely see you in the hotel room as a shark or as a Canadian. But oh, let me put myself in the first line and oh, let me get all the shots and play center. That's you. That was no, you. Far- Farky, just to jump in, <laughs> when he was when he was in Buffalo and he was in the game in Buffalo, he was the guy trading to the best team in the league, <laughs> trading himself to the best team in the league, and he was playing first line. Oh, that's what I he was always, doing. I always wondered when I put myself on the first line on these teams why uh, we our record was under 500 by Christmas in the video game. But <laughs> no, no. I was, Farky, I was a FIFA soccer player. Absolute <laughs> star. Great game. Oh, so I never, I was losers. never big into, into the NHL games. I, I mean, I played – I played a few times, but <laughs> I could see Mitch also going in and changing his player rating. Oh, they gave me a seventy-two. I'll bump that up eighty-two. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was definitely centering the line with uh, with Patrick Marlowe and Joe Thornton a few times. I'm not gonna... <laughs> For sure. For sure. Yeah. Oh god. Uh, oh. I'm trying to get one of those video game developers on the pod. By the way, they're hard to get, but I'm trying. So looks like a cool game. I'm actually excited to play it. I haven't played since uh, 2011 in NHL video game. I got so depressed in college playing with my roommate. He found a two-on-one every time. You could never stop it. I never played again after that. A decade later, I'm ready to give it another shot. But I don't have much time to play video games either. No. I don't know anything about video games. Not so anymore. I'm, I'm, yeah. No time. But the kids love, it. kids love it. They're still fun. The graphics are getting just – it's basically insane. But um, I don't have time either. But they're fun. Well, happy holidays, everybody. You can find us everywhere. The Elevate 02 podcast page on Instagram, regular Elevate 02 on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We've got the email address, elevate02podcast at gmail.com. We might be changing that up at some point, though, here soon, so stay tuned for that, making it a uh, easier email for you guys. And, uh, Mitch, I'll let you get the last word as uh, the holidays are upon us. Maybe the gift of a trip to the Elevate 02 camp might be a good gift for uh, somebody here. Ooh, that would be nice. Can't the uh, the spots are filling up fast? So hurry. Email camp at elevate02.com. Sign up. Let's go. There you go. Happy holidays, everybody. We'll see you again next Wednesday. Mitch, you always end it end it with the same thing. Give us your uh, your outro. Wait, what? You no always say boom time. at the end. Every yeah. time I talk, you go boom. Yeah, that's when you say my name. I go boom. Okay, well, then, <laughs> here we go. Cut. Merry, Hold on. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Hold Christmas. on. Three, two, one. There you go. Get in on the Elevate 02 camp. We will see you again next Wednesday. So, I'm Farky, Batesy, Strader, Mitch. Boom. This is the Elevate 02 podcast. The podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey. From on the ice to inside the front office. We bring you places you've never been before. 